This is the podcast of Hamul Community Church. We will prayerfully and worshipfully consider the fruit of patience. I'm going to start by reading from four passages. Uh, These are the ones in your outline. You probably won't have time to flip to them all. That's okay. We'll come back to them later. Let's go to God's word, starting with Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. And he, that's the Lord, passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Ephesians 4, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And John 16, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will glorify me. That's Christ. And let's pray. Father, we ask this morning that you conform conform us into your likeness. Help us to understand and apply your word. Strengthen our hearts to have faith in your promises. Help us to see these promises as beautiful and not burdensome. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So when we come to the fruit of the Spirit here in Galatians, we are coming to the middle of the story about fruitfulness. The story of fruitfulness starts in Genesis and it goes to Revelation and the fruit of the Spirit is just one part in the story. Fruitfulness. Fruitfulness in the Bible is often just a metaphor for having offspring. But God has always wanted more than just mere numbers. When God says, I want a fruitful people, he means he wants them to have a heart of righteousness that overflows with fruitful acts, with righteous acts, with righteous speech and righteous deeds and righteous thoughts. These are the fruits, just like the fruit on a tree gets its nutrient from the the roots and the trunk. So the Christian, we get our spiritual nutrients from our good God. Psalm 1, think of that. This is the image of a righteous person. We like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in season. That's the biblical image. Sometimes it's a fruit tree. Sometimes it's a grapevine. But that's the image we get all through the Bible of the believer Think of the garden, Genesis chapter 1, God's plan for mankind. Be fruitful and multiply, and they're spreading out across the whole earth. And what are they doing? They're spreading God's glory as they go across the whole entire earth, bringing his glory everywhere they go with them through their fruitful, righteous actions. But then the fall happens, and sin separated us from God cut the branch off from its root and trunk. And physically, we see them cut off from the garden, cut off from the tree of life. And spiritually, the same is happening, cut off from spiritual life in God. But God was merciful. Even though they are exiled from the garden, God is merciful. He promises life to come, promises his mercy, makes a plan, gives hints at it, And then God mercifully calls Abraham. He's going to use Abraham to be, to make for himself this fruitful people that would spread across the world, bringing God's blessing, spreading out like the number of stars. We have that promise of blessing. 
And isn't it interesting how he chooses a barren couple for his plan of fruitfulness? Yes, he wanted us to know. It's from him. And these people do grow into a great nation. And at its heart is this temple with garden-like imagery inside of it. And priests who are to administer this blessing and they're told they're going to be a whole kingdom of priests blessing the world. But we know that even with strong leaders like, like the judges, even with wise leaders like Solomon, even with leaders with hearts who loved the Lord like David and Moses, the result was the same as the garden. There was sin and there was exile. They were exiled from the land flowing with milk and honey. The temple was destroyed. Sin always leads to exile. God was going to keep his plan, even though it seemed like time and time again his plan for fruitfulness would not succeed. He told the prophets about his plan. To Ezekiel, he told this, the wilderness, the dry land, It will be glad. The desert, it will rejoice and blossom. For water will gush into the wilderness and streams into the desert. The eyes of the blind will be opened. They will see the glory of the Lord. So this fruitfulness image, the glory of the Lord spreading around and all of the garden imagery. Then he tells Isaiah, similar language, the hill will become barren unfruitfulness here the hill is the people the the nation the hill will be barren until the spirit from on high is poured out then the desert will become an orchard that's Isaiah chapter 32 and it's amazing because God reveals how his fruitfulness plan will happen through the spirit the spirit will be sent and we hear echoes of this right just in the phrase fruit of the spirit I wonder if Paul was thinking of this, Isaiah 32, as he's writing this letter, the fruit of the Spirit. The plan is continuing to be worked out. God will have a fruitful people, and then Jesus comes. And Jesus bears perfect fruit. But Jesus says, I'm more than just a branch bearing fruit. I'm the vine. Remember when he said that? I am the trunk itself. And if you want life, you need to be cleaned and you need to be grafted onto me. So Jesus, almost as the tree of life himself, says, come to me, get forgiveness from me and be grafted onto me through the spirit. And this was God's amazing plan. When we could not do it, he did it and grafts us onto him so we can be a fruitful people. And then we think the great commission Go out, into the all, go out into all the world and I will be with you. Think back to that original plan to go out into the world. Spread God's glory. But now we do it with the spirit and we do it with the gospel. That's the message we are bringing to the world. So think of this story. We also get to Revelation where we have all this garden imagery at the end of Revelation. There's a new creation. The tree of life, rivers flowing. And Now, the story gets complete because though now our fruit is often small, (laughs) pecked by the birds, malnourished, it's still fruit. It really is spiritual fruit that we're bearing. But because of this sinful world and the sin still in our hearts, it's not perfect. But one day in heaven in the new creation, new earth, our fruit will be perfect. We will be with him and we will be like him. So when we we come to the fruit of the Spirit, let's put ourselves in this story and thank the Lord for where we are in his amazing plan. So the specific fruit that we want to think about today in the story is the fruit of patience. So let's start by defining patience. So maybe when you have memorized this passage, you memorized Patience, that word, but when we read it today, we're reading out of the the NIV. That's the the Bible in the the pew in front of you. Um, It says forbearance. Well, forbearance is a helpful word. 
Uh, forbearance helps us to remember that uh, patience is more than just waiting. That might be the only idea we get from patience, but forbearance tells us, oh, there's more to waiting. It, it includes suffering sometimes. But the Bible does talk about patience as waiting. If you are waiting in line at a theme park, you're there for a long time. You're, you have to show patience. Students here, young people here, if on Christmas morning you're up early, you're just waiting to open the presents. You're pausing what you want to do so badly. You're anticipating the good to come. And you need self-control, right, and patience to just keep from running over and, and opening up the presents. But you know, you know that something better, you're waiting for something good. You're waiting for something beautiful. You're waiting for the whole family to be there and do this together, which is putting off that instant gratification for something promised to be better, for something you know will be better. So that's one sense of patience. It's waiting. It's waiting for something better to come. And the Bible talks about patience like this a lot. Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. We're waiting for his good. We're not we're not rushing to open it. We're, we're waiting for him in his timing. Isaiah 40, you know this one? Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. We're waiting for the Lord. So Romans 8, 25. But if we hope for what we don't yet have, we wait patiently for it. So in this sense, patience is waiting, hopefully, on the Lord. But the Bible also talks about patience in another sense, and that's why some translations will say long suffering here. Long suffering is endurance, it's trial. It's not just waiting in line, it's it's waiting in line holding a heavy backpack. <laughs> and the backpack is digging into your shoulders or or poking into your side, or or maybe the people around you are mocking you for standing in the line and not just cutting into the front. Or, or maybe people around you that you know are handing you their backpacks too and you're, you're getting more burdens and it's long suffering, it's heavy, it's hard, but you're enduring. You're patient, you know what's at the end of the line. Maybe it's that roller coaster or a, a good food truck or an art museum that you're waiting to get into. Remember David, when he's being chased around the wilderness, King David is, or King Saul is causing some suffering for David. He's on the run. And then David comes upon Saul, sleeping. All of Saul's men sleeping. David has his sword, he has a spear. His men tell him, Oh, look what the Lord has given you, <laughs> Saul, into your hands. David shows patience. This is not the Lord's timing. Patience. We read about this kind of patience in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 4.12, when we are cursed, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure it. Romans 12.12, 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in affliction. And then the James passage we, we read together. This is all talking about this kind of patience in suffering. So you, you know, whether you're enduring another round of chemotherapy and its effects, but you're doing it with a heart that is trusting in the Lord, you are being patient and suffering. If you're responding in love to that rudeness, either from a stranger or even from a loved one, but you're not responding with sarcasm or anger, you're responding in love, that is this kind of patience. That job that you need, you're waiting on the Lord, but without fear and panic, you're showing this kind of long-suffering patience. And sometimes patience hurts, doesn't it? That's why the psalmists say over and over, Lord, how long? How long, O Lord? Patience can hurt, but we know who to call out to. Lord, how long? How, mu how long may, must I wait? So here, here's a short definition of 
Christian patience. Patience is waiting on the Lord in hope. Patience is waiting on the Lord in hope. And the, the word hope at the end is so important to this. To be hopeful is to know who's in charge. To be hopeful is to know he who is in charge knows what's best for me. If we don't have hope in our waiting, our patience could just be apathy. <laughs> our patience could just be defeatism. You know, I, I just give, I'm giving up here. That's not biblical patience. Patience is active in its hope. The best way to see what patience looks like is to look at God and to see how he is patient. Now, his patience is different than ours. God doesn't need hope. <laughs> he has the power to make it happen immediately. But God's patience is significant because he does, del- he does portray long-suffering in the face of sin. Let's start with Exodus 34, 6. We read this earlier. God comes to Moses and says, prepare yourself, I'm going to pass in front of you, and I'm going to tell you my name. And Moses goes up onto Mount Sinai, and God tells him his name. And he says all of this, the Lord, the Lord, this compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin but will not leave the guilty unpunished. I'm gonna tell you my name. (laughs) Then he tells Moses all of this. He tells us all of this about himself as if his name and his very character cannot be separated. My name is compassion. My name is grace. My name is slow to anger. My name is abounding in love. My name is forgiveness. That's who God is. God's patient. As we look at God's patience in the world, in the Bible, um, we can do it in three ways. One, we can look at his display of patience in creation. Another is his display of creation with sinners. And then third, we'll look at his, his display of patience with um, specific sinners, you and me as, as individuals. But let's start with his display of patience in creation. This is something fun to talk about. Families, maybe you can do this more uh, at home. Uh, or not just families, anybody can do this more later. We could talk about this at lunch. How has God shown his patience in creation? Well, I'm going to give you a few ideas. One is through the seasons. God shows us patience by giving us seasons. In the winter, things change, right? Uh, it gets darker. We have less light, less time to be working outside. It gets colder most places. It gets colder and uh, you're not out and free and working as much. And and most places the plants stop producing. uh, You're not getting as much food. So for most of history, during this season, you are less productive. You've stored up all the food. You put a pause on those big projects. God does this. He doesn't seem like he's in a hurry for us to get all these things done. He could have made it summer all year, you know, just changing the axis of the earth just a little bit. So it's summer all year. Uh, James 5 makes this a similar note about the seasons. He says, be patient, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits on the fruit of the earth, being patient until he receives the late rains. The seasons connected to the rains, being patient in the seasons. I think seasons do teach us. God God is a patient God, and he wants us to be patient with things. Parenting also is a way that teaches us about patience. Think about the way God designed our childbearing and, and parenting. I mean, God told Adam and Eve, spread around the earth. That's what he wants us to do. That's what he told us to do, spread out, people. But then he made humans the slowest of all the mammals at at doing this job. You know, if he was in a rush, he could have made us a little bit different. So the Virginia opossum goes from fertilization to birth in 12 days. 
Hey, that wouldn't be so bad. 12 days of pregnancy? Uh, but the Arctic fox averages 11 pups per litter. Yeah, that wouldn't, uh, not so much that one, but baby zebras, they can walk 30 minutes after they're born. Some seal pups stop nursing four days after four days and then get their own food. A mouse reaches adulthood in six months. Okay, that's, you know, this is a bit silly, but God could have made the slow human process of childbearing a lot faster if he was in a hurry for us to spread around the world, but he didn't. So that's another way his, his creation shows us his slowness. Maybe something fun to do is think about the slow animals and how silly it is to, to see them and think about how God teaches us patience through his creation in some of these animals like the sloth. I just kind of laugh when you see the sloth moving along. God reveals his patience through creation, but he reveals it to us through sinners, how he treats the world. Uh, creation, we can see some things about God, but the main way we know about God, the chief way we know about God is by what he reveals to himself, to us in his word. So let's think about how God has been patient with the world. At the fall, God could have justly, in all justness, put an end to humanity. See that several times in scripture. He could have ended it in all justice and not have done wrong. Through the patriarchs, we see God so patient. Remember Abraham's lack of faith with Hagar, Jacob's lies, the 10 brothers selling Joseph into slavery. God was so patient with them when they could have so easily destroyed themselves. He was patient. And to the nations who were living in the promised land, think about how God was patient to them. Abraham, you can't take the promised land yet. You need to wait because their sin is not reached its full, Abraham. So 400 years, God was patient with the nations there. And think of Israel in the wilderness, how they're grumbling. Think of them making the golden calf and then grumbling about food, grumbling about water, grumbling about meat. God is patient with them. And as the kingdom grows, God is patient during the monarchy. When time after time they go after the gods of the other nations and worship them, but God is patient, patiently restoring them, patiently sending them prophets. And now even as the church, God is patient with the church, isn't he? See how patiently God inspired Paul to write these letters to the church in Corinth, who was terribly in sin, to the church in Galatia. We've seen that, how patient Paul was, even in his strong language. There's patience in this letter, isn't it, with this church? God didn't just tell Paul, Paul, time to start another church. Galatia's done. No, God is a patient God. And think of the, the letters to the seven churches in Revelation. All of their faults, God is being patient with them. Think of his patience to us as a church. We're not a perfect church, but God has been so patient with us. So in scripture, we see God's patience over and over with the world, with his people, with you and me. Now, let's think for a minute about ourselves. Let's get a little personal here. It's pretty easy to say, yeah, you were patient with those crazy Corinthians, those foolish Galatians. But take a minute to think about yourself and how many times, how many times has your sin deserved even a natural consequence? You're looking at your phone while you're driving and you don't get into that accident. How many times has that happened? How many relationships might have been destroyed how many jobs might have been lost how maybe jail time god god keeps a lot of natural consequences from happening to us he's patient with us we shouldn't think of that as just being lucky i got so lucky that don't think of it like that god is being patient with you think about how many times your your life could have wandered into destruction if your anger, if your lust, if your jealousy had succeeded, if you had gotten what you wanted and God hadn't said no. 
God's patient with you. God's patient with me. He is so patient, brothers and sisters. Every single day, God is patient with us. When we forget about him, he's blessing us. When we purposely ignore him, he's taking care of us like a loving father. He is patient with you. Why is he so patient with you? If we have learned anything from Galatians, we know that his patience with us is not based on our deserving it. We've seen that so much in Galatians. Why is he so patient with you? Do you know why? Can you answer that question? Why is he patient with you? Did you notice that last verse in the Exodus passage? God's revealing his name, says all these things about forgiveness and patience. But that last verse, but I will not leave the guilty unpunished. That is also part of God's name. It's part of who he is. And it sounds kind of contradictory. I will forgive the guilty, but I will not leave the guilty unpunished. For hundreds of years, people came to this verse. They must have said, what? How? In some way, the sacrifice pointed towards how, but they knew even the sacrifice is not what is forgiving our sins. How, how, and how can our sins be punished? Well, the answer is in Christ, isn't it? Where God's justice and his mercy come out. Christ comes and he says, just like God's name, I will forgive you. He says, I will forgive you. God's very name, I will forgive you. And he also says, you must be punished, but I will take your punishment. Patience, the word patience means, it doesn't mean it's completely gone. It means I'm waiting. God's patience with us means there still must be some kind of dealing with sin, some kind of judgment for sin. God's patience for you, Christian, comes from the cross. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, God is still patient with you. But one day, his patience will turn to justice and you will be exiled. You will have to take the punishment yourself. If you don't come to Christ in faith, giving your sin to him, you must take the punishment of exile forever apart from him. So today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, but come to him in faith. God is patient. And God calls his church to be like him, to be patient like him. God's patience is beautiful. And God wants his church to be beautiful. So we come across a number of verses like Ephesians 4.2. Be completely humble, gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Here we're being patient with each other, church. Have you ever heard of the one another passages? These are passages that have the word one another. They're instructions to the church for how to treat each other. You can look it up. Show me the one another verses and you'll get a list of over 50 of them. It's how we treat each other. Here's a few of them. Love one another, John 13. Be devoted to one another. I'm not going to read all the references. Honor one another. Live in harmony with one another. Care for one another. Serve one another. Bear one another's burdens. Forgive one another. Be patient with one another. Be kind to one another. Submit to one another. Bear with one another. Show hospitality to one another. All of those are different verses. There's over 50 of these one another verses teaching us what it's supposed to be like as a local church. So how many of those require patience? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> what does a local church look like? Patience. Patience. Why do we need patience? Because we're so close together. We're, we're working together. 
We're ministering together. We're praying together. We're helping each other. We're discipling each other. We're crying together. When you start getting together that much as sinners, you're going to start needing patience because <laughs> those one and others are also sinful one and others. So you are going to need patience. In our contemporary culture here, there's a problem when you can go to church and not have to exercise patience. When you can be a part of a church and not have to exercise patience. We just have this unhealthy individualism in our culture, especially. It just says, Christianity is just about me and God, and I can do that God part online. I'm good. No. All of these one and other commands teach us what the church is to look like. Being a Christian means being so connected with the other people here that you need patience. Not just the people that you get along with. You need patience because we are called to be together with every other believer in the local church who has made the commitment, I'm one anothering you and you're one, one anothering me. And that's part of the reason why membership is significant. Membership is a way of letting each other know, I'm one of the one another's. Membership is a way where the elders who hear the confession of faith can say to the congregation, I agree, this is a one another. And it's a way of committing. You, you make a commitment in membership. You make a covenant. We have a church covenant. It says, I make a covenant before the local believers before me. I will one another you, and you must one another me. That's what Christian life is. This patient life together. Patience is part of a church life, but it's also part of a family, not family life. And there's a lot we could think about here, about patience in the family. I want to just give a short word to husbands, to fathers. Fathers, husbands, set the tone of patience in your home. Make patience be the air that everybody's breathing as you're living together in your family. That does mean being slow to anger, but it means more than that. It means long-suffering. It means bearing the sins of your wife and, and children, bearing them the way Christ did, forgiving them the way Christ did the church. Patience. God is patient. He calls his church to be patient. So then it, we want to know, how can I be more patient, Lord? How can I be more beautiful? How can I be like you? How can I bear this, this wonderful fruit? Well, we have read just in, in chapter 5 uh, the ways to do this. Walk by the Spirit. That's 516. 518. Be led by the Spirit, verse 22. Bear the fruit of the Spirit, verse 25. Live by the Spirit, verse 25 again. Keep in step with the Spirit. All of these are the same way, showing us how to bear this fruit, saying the same thing. The Spirit is doing a work in you. He's, he's transforming, he's leading, but don't just stand by as, as a bystander. Don't just sit there. Keep in step. There's this action. Do what the Spirit is doing. Follow his lead. Don't resist him. Don't make him come back after you, pull you, because he will. He's not going to leave you, but don't make him do that. Don't make him care. Walk with him. Follow him. That's what we're to do. Well, how do we know where he's leading? I, I, I really think that some people really struggle with this. How do I know where the Spirit's leading? I really struggled with this as a, as a young man. How do I know where you're leading, Lord? I think we overly mystify this. I think I overly worried about the Spirit's leading. I, I do hear quite often the way people talk about the Spirit as if it means if I'm surrendered enough, then I will get these special visions or I will hear these unique words 
Or I will have this feeling in my heart that I know tells me who to marry. Or I have this feeling that tells me what to do. That's not the way the Bible talks about the Spirit's work. I had someone tell me, I have a word from the Spirit for you. Steak. It's like, wow, that's confusing. The Spirit isn't a spirit of confusion. What? What? I didn't think they meant like, I'm going to eat the steak tonight, but steak in the ground, maybe? I don't know. It's confusing. But, but think about how the, how the spirit is talked about, how his leading is talked about. Like, like John 16 in the upper room discourse where Jesus is promising the spirit to come. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in all truth. And he won't speak from his own. He'll speak what he hears. He'll glorify me. Because it's from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. The Spirit is working in us, leading us in the glory of Christ. And he's giving us truth, not confusing truth. He's giving us truth. And where do we find the clearest truth in Scripture? The Spirit leads us through Scripture. He guides us. That's where he is most clear. Not giving us these coded things that we have to try to understand. And No. This is the regular way that God speaks to us. Yes, he does occasionally speak some other way, but he never promises to speak that way. What he does do is to, he promises this, to regularly, consistently powerfully, clearly speak to us through his word. That's why the word is sometimes called the sword of the spirit. It's the tool that the spirit uses. So if you want to grow in patience, let's follow the spirit as he leads us in God, in Christ glorifying truth through his word. So I want to give two promises, two categories of truth from Scripture that we can hold on to to make us more patient. The first is the sovereignty of God, and the second is the mercy of God. Scripture teaches us that God is sovereign. By sovereign here, I just mean that God's in complete control. He is ruler of all things. He's king of kings and lord of lords. I'm going to read another list of verses Just let these wash over you. Ephesians 1, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Job 42, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Psalm 115, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Proverbs 16, 33, The lot is cast to the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. Proverbs 19, many are the plans of the mind of man, but it's the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Exodus 4.11, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute? Who makes him deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Lord is in control of disabilities, even. Isaiah 45, I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. 1 Peter 4, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their soul to their faithful creator. So how do these promises, these truths, the Spirit makes clear to us, make us more patient? Well, if you're holding on to the promises, like the promise that God makes well-being and calamity, that's from the Lord, and someone rear-ends you, you could say something like this, God, you could have stopped that but you didn't, what are you doing here? I will be patient and see. 
could this person need the gospel? I, I will be ready to share. Help me be ready to share. That's how the patient person uses the sovereignty of God in their lives. If you are struggling with an illness, long illness, or a disability, you're holding on to Exodus 34. You're saying, God, I know that you are sovereign over this disability that causes me pain or embarrassment or confusion every day. And even though I I can't see the good that's come out of it, Lord, I trust you. You are sovereign over this, and I hold on in glorious hope to the day when my body will be perfected. Maybe someone you know is very sick. You don't know if they will live yourself, maybe. Maybe you you think your time is near. But God's sovereignty helps you to be patient and say, God, you are in charge here. Though you slay me, I will yet trust in you. Those are the words of Job. Though you slay me, I will trust in you. But even for simple things that tend to irritate us and make us angry and lose our cool, even for simple things, you hold on to Proverbs 16. The lot is cast, but the decision is from the Lord. So you, the light turns red. <laughs> you have to stop. You're late. Instead of exploding in anger, Lord, okay. Maybe this will stop me from getting an accident. I don't know, Lord. Maybe it's for someone else. I don't know. But Lord, you're in control. I'm not going to boil over. I trust you here. B.B. Warfield. Maybe you've heard his name. He's an American theologian. He taught at uh, Princeton Seminary when it was a seminary, early 1900s. Uh, He's most known for his books about the inerrancy of Scripture. But what most people don't know is that when he got married, 25 years old, he goes away onto his honeymoon to Germany His wife Annie and him are walking together. It looks stormy. And then lightning strikes Annie and paralyzes her permanently. And so for the next 39 years, as his wife is lived, he is the caregiver for her. She needs special care. And he almost never leaves the home for over two hours. He goes and teaches his class, comes back home. Goes and meets with someone, comes back home. Goes to church, comes back home. He's caregiving for his wife for 39 years. What patience, with patience. He wrote a reflection on Romans 8.28 during this time. Romans 8.28 is that we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him. This is what he wrote about that. All that will come to you is under his controlling hand. And if he governs all, then good will befall those to him he will. He will govern all things so that we will reap good from all that befalls us. So we can be patient. We can be patient because we know that God is sovereign. Think about what impatience does. Impatience is a kind of litmus test of the heart. Why am I being impatient? It's a matter of trust. It's revealing our lack of trust in our all-supreme Father. A second set of biblical promises that the Spirit leads us to, that we can hold on to, that will make us more patient, are those promises of mercy so many verses like this, Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Psalm 103, he does not deal with us according to our sins. Colossians 2, 13, when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave you your sins. There's so many, so many of these verses. And we think about the parable of the unmerciful servant who was forgiven just so much debt and yet could not forgive. We don't want to be like that. We've received so much patience. patience. We've received so much mercy. 
let's give. God has given us an ocean full of mercy. So when someone needs a cool cup of patience, let's give it to them. God has made us to be fruitful. And we're in the midst of that story. God has made us, made us to grow the fruit of patience. And it is a beautiful thing. And while we live in this impatient world, this briar patch world, let our fruit of patience be delicious and refreshing. God has made us church beautiful. We are. We are a beautiful tree. So let us grow the fruit of patience together. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being so patient with us. Thank you for being so merciful. Truly, in Christ, your, your mercies are new every morning, and this does fill us with gratitude. So let these mercies do their work in our lives. This week we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to the podcast of Hamul Community Church. For more information and other sermons, please visit www.hamul.org. Hamul.org.